Hi and thanks very much for checking out this YouTube version of a presentation that was originally given at the EAGE's Near Surface Geoscience Conference in September 2023. Uh, my name is Dr Adam Booth, I'm uh, an Associate Professor of Applied Geophysics in the School of Earth and Environment at the University of Leeds. And to cut a long story short, um, I submitted this presentation to the, uh, the EAGE's conference but over summer um, I suffered a, a medical problem and so I was unable to attend the, the conference itself. Um, um, my colleague Ed Cox from Atkins very kindly stepped in to, uh, to do the presentation on our behalf, but I just thought I would complement Ed's presentation with this YouTube version. Um, so if you've uh, seen the conference presentation, if you've just happened across this one, uh, please do feel free to ask me any questions via the email address that will appear at the end of this uh, presentation. So this presentation is an overview of a project that we've been working on for the last 12 months or so. Um, and the project recognises that the way that we present geophysical data potentially raises some barriers to public engagement. And so we've been moving from a visual data space into a tactile data space. Um, it's a multidisciplinary project that uh, features uh, myself and Lily Makin from Leeds School of Earth and Environment as the geophysicist in the project. Um, but it also draws on um, expertise from uh, the School of Design and the School of Mechanical Engineering, um, just to think about how we go about um, optimizing the design of these uh, tactile communication resources and then how we actually go about fabricating them. Um, there's also representation from a uh, heritage agency, uh, and uh, that's uh, through Tegwin Roberts at Barnsley Museums. So by way of establishing motivation, I will start with this pretty spectacular image here that is borrowed from Chris Lockyer and the work that he's done uh, as, as part of the, the Hertfordshire Geophysical Survey. Um, Clearly, there are um, major responses within a radar data set there that are very indicative of there being archaeological remains buried beneath that particular site. Um, this here is specifically as a radar data set. Um, and radar and the full suite of geophysical methods are really excellent ways of showing what we've got buried in the ground and then also uh, for um, revealing that content to, um, to an interested audience. But the problem is, is that we always present geophysical data images. So if you are visually able, then that's absolutely fine. You, you can appreciate that image. Uh, but you might be um, archaeologically interested, but you have a, visually Im a visual impairment. So we have to ask the question, how inclusive is our typical geophysical data presentation? If we are only showing data in visual formats, are we potentially excluding people from, say, heritage communication? Could we therefore be doing more to maximise inclusivity? Now, obviously, we're not alone in thinking like this. You can see that um, presumably Nottingham City Council has already been uh, aware of these barriers to inclusivity because um, this is a photo that was given to me by Neil Linford from uh, Historic England while he himself was on a trip to Nottingham. And what he saw was outside St Mary's Church there, um, there is also this uh, tactile representation of the church itself and of its of its facade so that if you are visually impaired you can at least start to engage with the views that uh, visually able um, people uh, can, can take for granted um, so you can see that there are there's braille annotations at the bottom of our information sign and there's also a tactile representation of the layout so can we take these similar considerations and convert our geophysical data into um, a tactile representation. So how can we go about taking a radar time slice and converting that to a textural surface? Uh, there are many considerations that, that we have to make because we want this surface to be functional, we want it to be informative, and we also want it to be user-friendly. So how do we go about uh, scaling those, uh, those image amplitudes that we can see and converting them into a tactile surface? The, the, there are more considerations than I'm able to go into in this sort of 10 minute video. Um, so I'm just gonna give an overview of some of the big ones. And the first is that um, what we uh, as geophysicists um, are all comfortable with is the idea that we can um, express recorded geophysical amplitudes as some kind of grayscale surface. You could see it in that uh, previous image from Chris Lockyer where the very bold black colours were representative of high amplitudes. What I'm showing here is some sort of schematic representation of a grayscale colour bar 
and the normalized amplitude that, that that's trying to convey. Here I'm using white as high amplitude, black as low amplitude, and gray as somewhere between. So you could imagine that instead of uh, expressing this as amplitude, we actually express it as topographic relief. And there's the idea that we could somehow make a, a 3D print, we could engrave um, uh, the, the grayscale uh, amplitudes and, and make that tactile surface. But there's a question about how much relief is, is too little or too much relief. I would say that this diagram here shows um, an impression of too little relief. Uh, here, I think you could see that if you were trying to feel that topographic relief, then maybe everything would feel the same. There's not enough contrast between the background black colours, uh, the white colours, and then the intermediate grey colours. So um, when it comes to relief, is more actually more? Does it make the, the tactile surface um, more user friendly? I would actually say that something like this would be a mistake as well, because uh, although the the highs are now very prominent, you could almost um, uh, imagine a situation where uh, your finger sort of bounces over the the highest relief areas of of this model, and it's not able to sense the lower relief bits because effectively uh, your your finger can't enter that lower amplitude space because it, it's trapped by, by by the higher amplitude regions either side. So there is some happy medium between that. Um, I don't know what it is. Uh, part of this project is to take these tactile models forward into participatory workshops with um, variously uh, cited participants. But as a guideline, these uh, researchers here in 1995 uh, suggested that the limit of sensitivity for the human finger is about 0.4 millimetres. So what I would take from this is that if, if we have something like 0.4 millimetres um, or no, no less than 0.4 millimetres between the, the topographic regions that we want someone to explore, then that, that could be uh, advantageous. However, the answer really lies through uh, these participatory workshops. Another design consideration is the physical size of the model that we would like participants to interact with. Uh, is it enough to say we have a palm top representation of the geophysical data? Do we want something slightly larger that fits nicely on a table or even larger like a big centerpiece in, in a museum exhibit? Um, what you can see is one of our um, team members there interacting with um, sort of palm top size um, palm top scale uh, tactile models and seeing what she can feel in there. Um, Lawson and Bracken in 2012 um, suggested that portability is key. They were doing research on shape recognition through um, th with tactile resources and what they noticed is that participants um, were best able to identify shapes where they could really pick up a model and start to orientate it as they want. Now for me this starts to argue in favour of something that is is, is palm top so that people can move it around uh, as they wish um, but again uh, we need the feedback from those participatory workshops. Of course it's also informed by the size of the key features in the data that we would like to show. Um, obviously if we have a, a very small resource then the features within that small resource will themselves be small. If we go big then the features themselves will be big. And again there's a question of um, the spatial sensitivity of human fingers, uh, work that was done by Jirocca et al in 2021. Again uh, this number 0.4 millimeters comes up as being something like the limit of spatial sensitivity in, uh, in your fingertips. Now the third consideration that I'll introduce you to is one for the geophysical purists and I do consider myself a geophysical purist in that sense um, because it concerns the sort of fidelity in our tactile image uh, in terms of what are we what information are we actually trying to convey and these two images um, really show this picture here so the upper image is my interpretation of a geophysical data set uh, the lower image is uh, a more kind of honest representation of the geophysical data in that it contains both signal and noise now if we were to present users with a tactile version of an interpretation then in all likelihood that tactile resource would be more simple and potentially more appreciable by um by, by the user however i would say that the interpretation is just subjective. Other people would interpret different features. And in just presenting that interpretation, do we prevent a user from making up their own mind about 
the about what the geophysical data contain. Um, if we were to keep some signal and noise in there, then we're almost um, showing a more educative resource about the difficulty that geophysicists face and how interpretation is rather subjective. And so it's a question of simplicity versus, if you like, geophysical integrity. Now, I would suggest that potentially we want to move to present both. We present both the, the simplified interpretation and then the, um, the kind of more honest representation of the data. But as I say, this is a question that we would be asking people um, in, in participatory workshops for their feedback. Now, at this point, I will introduce the data that we've been using in this project to date, um, because these two uh, slices that you can see here are taken from um, the particular project that we were working on with Barnsley Museums and that all of our prototypes to date have, have used. So um, let's take a look at the, the overall data set. So the radar data that we are using in this project come from a 2018 survey conducted um, just outside Elsica Heritage Centre uh, in collaboration with Barnsley Museums. Uh, Elsica is uh, a site of, of major industrial occupation from the Industrial Revolution up to about the 1980s. Uh, in the picture there on the left, you can see an aerial photo of Elska Heritage Centre. A lot of those buildings are um, original industrial buildings from that kind of era. Um, and our particular area of interest is marked by the star. Um, that star marks the location of the image you can see on the right, which is um, an old gas storage tank. Now, at the moment, uh, the, that area has been completely reworked into parkland. It's quite a nice area for you to go and walk your dog. Um, and there's no evidence of whether that gas tank is left in the ground or not. Has the site been completely remediated? Has everything been removed? Or is the tank itself still there? So um, Elsica Heritage Centre were interested in having us perform a geophysical survey uh, to see if we could answer those questions. And here is some of the data that we recorded um, over in, I'll start with panel C, which is uh, the results of um, a microgravity survey. You can see in the orange region highlighted there is that there's a small gravity low, but a similar region in um, panel D, which uh, is uh, some electrical resistivity tomography data, that area is, uh, is associated with um, low electrical resistances. Now, if I take these two uh, bits of information together, then I think that um, the gravity low indicates that there is some sort of void left in the ground. But when we did some modeling, that's not enough. Um, it, it's not a, a, a strong enough negative gravity anomaly to suggest that there's still um, an empty you know, air-filled tank left in the ground. Uh, the resistivity data with those low resistivities in that area um, indicate to me that there's potentially some um, electrically conductive groundwater that is pooled in the ground at that particular location. Um, and so what I might suggest from these two bits of information is that perhaps the, the brick perimeter wall of the gas storage tank is still present, but the main tank itself is not. Now, in some ways, that's supported by the radar data over on the left hand of the screen in panel B there. Um, you can see there's this circular feature that I think is the, um, the brick perimeter wall. Um, there is no uh, sort of strong reflector inside that circular perimeter wall that suggests that we've, we've hit the gas tank. And instead, you just get these sort of uh, rather chaotic areas that I think is a, a debris backfill um, in, uh, inside the, the pit of the storage tank, um, probably from the demolition of the site. You can see there's also a, a straight-edged um, L-shaped section uh, that I think is a, um, a building related to, uh, to the gas works at this site. So with those very clear radar time slices, we set about uh, converting them into tactile resources. Um, the first of these tactile resources you can see just there uh, in, the, in the lower of those two images. Um, this was really just a, a trial to see if we fed that radar image into um, laser cutting software, would the laser cutter make any kind of uh, viable representation of the data? Would we be able to at least uh, feel the, the same kind of shapes and features that were present in the data. Um, so uh, that's a, a laser cut plywood model. Uh, it's 30 centimeters wide with about one millimeter relief between the lowest and the highest sections you can see. Um, one of the problems that we found with the plywood is that 
um, despite it being a, a cheap um, fabrication medium, um, sometimes the grain in the plywood was actually more significant than the textures we were trying to convey, which is uh, obviously not good uh, from a, a data communication point of view. So we also tried different methods. Um, this is um, a heat sensitive swell paper. Um, what you do is you print a grayscale image on it and then you heat treat it and the darker parts of that absorb more of the heat and they, uh, they, they swell up. Um, so you can see one of those um, being made there. Um, it's very cheap. The low uh, relief uh, can be problematic. Uh, we certainly don't achieve this um, even even a one millimetre um, re uh, relief between the minimum and the maximum, uh, but um, it, it's very cheap, so it's worth um, uh, trialling in some of our workshops. At the other end of the spectrum is this engraved acrylic slice you can see. Here we're able to go up to four millimetres of relief between the maximum and the minimums. Um, it is more expensive, uh, but it's more robust, and you think that it's the kind of thing that you could see being featured in, um, in a museum exhibit. It's also translucent, and that's a really interesting consideration because um, it's very rare that a visually impaired person has 100% uh, lack of vision. Um, very often you find that um, people have a residual vision, which allows them to be sensitive to high contrast colours. So you could imagine taking a, a resource like this and shining a light through it, much as uh, the way it's been presented by just putting the, uh, the acrylic uh, slice in front of a window. Uh, so you start to get high contrast colour information as well as the tactile resource. And so it's these resources uh, that we've been moving into various participatory workshops. What do those participatory workshops look like? Well, in the first instance, we worked with sighted users and asked them to feel some of the resources that we'd made. Uh, and they then went and, um, uh, and sketched the features that they thought that they perceived. Now, uh, very definitely, there was the most success uh, with straight edges. So from the radar perspective, if you're looking at time slices, uh, say, with, with pipes or cables or services running through your data, then um, I would suggest that people are going to be uh, very likely to be able to feel and correctly feel um, the information that you're trying to convey. It's also, um, with the benefit of hindsight, maybe using data more like those that I showed in the introduction to this presentation from Chris Lockyer, um, th that could potentially have been um, an easier starting place. But we don't like to make things easy for ourselves, otherwise we, we wouldn't be geophysicists. Um, this is a video from a participatory workshop we did with a visually impaired user, and you can see that their hands are moving around that circular feature. So whether or not they interpret that feature as being circular, um, they can distinguish the regions of low relief versus high relief, and they can they are able to, to track it. It's uh, important to say that I think if this resource was going to get incorporated within heritage communication, we wouldn't just give somebody the resource and expect them to feel their way around it. There would almost be an audio tool that would say, OK, if you move into the resource space, you should be able to feel um, you know, a, a straight edge. You should be able to start to feel a circular area with um, you know, a, a random uh, fill inside it. Something along those lines, but again, a subject for future participatory workshops. So all of the insight from those participatory workshops is being analysed at the moment. And so by way of wrapping up, I would just like to say that heritage is really just the beginning. Um, if we take a tactile resource that seems to benefit access for one group, then why can't that benefit access for all? Certainly, um, if you've got kids or you've ever worked with schools groups, you'll see that children are often much uh, more enthusiastic about tactile resources than they are just looking at images. They, they really want to pick things up and, and touch and feel them. So so if you're trying to explain uh, geophysical concepts to a schools group, then perhaps tactile resources like these could be really valuable. And of course, we move beyond the, the heritage and archaeological sphere. Uh, the data that I'm showing here uh, is um, an electrical conductivity data set from RSK Geophysics, where um, the electrical conductivity is being used as a measure of the risk of, of sinkholes. Um, this was conducted in, in a housing estate. So if you imagine that you're a, a member of the, of, of the community within that housing estate, you'd like to know where the risk of sinkholes is. But if you're visually impaired, you're not going to be able to appreciate that image. You could 
imagine that we could convert those uh, conductivity data into a tactile representation and include some indication of where the housing estate was as well. So that if you do have visually impaired or otherwise neurodiverse members of the community, they can be involved with, with the discussion too. With that, I'd just uh, like to wrap up and acknowledge the various funding agencies that have supported us so far, and also to, uh, to just say that all the interviews, all the participatory workshops were conducted under a, a University of Leeds ethical review framework. Um, shout out to Duke Make Studio in Leeds for fabricating the acrylic models, and um, in his absence, uh, thanks very much to Ed Cox for standing in as a replacement presenter at the AG's Near, Near Surface Geoscience uh, 2023 conference. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and you got some insights in what we're doing. If you've got any questions, please do contact me at the email address below and I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much for watching.